This is chapter 9, Molecular Geometry and Bonding Theories. We saw in chapter 8 that Lewis structure helped us to understand the compositions of molecules and their covalent bonds. However, Lewis structures do not show one of the most important aspects of molecules, their overall shapes. The shape and size of molecules, sometimes referred to as molecular architecture, are defined by the angles and distances between the nuclei of the component's atoms. The shape and size of a molecule of a substance, together with the strength and polarity of its bonds, largely determine the properties of the substance. Some of the most dramatic examples of the important roles of molecular architecture are seen in biochemical reactions. Here we have the uh, structure or the molecular model, model of a trivastatin, better known as Lipitor. In the body, Lipitor inhibits the action of a key enzyme called HMG-CoA reductase. This is a large complex biomolecule that is critical in the biochemical sequence that synthesizes cholesterol in the liver. An inhibition of its action leads to reduced cholesterol production. The molecules of Lipitor have two properties that led to their pharmaceutical effectiveness. First, the molecule has the correct overall shape to fit perfectly in an important cavity in the HMG-CoA reductase enzyme, thus blocking the, that site from the molecules involved in cholesterol synthesis. Second, the molecule has the right atoms and arrangements of electrons to form strong interaction within the cavity, cavity assuring that the Lipitor molecule will stick where it should. Thus, the drug action of Lipitor is largely a consequence of the shape and size of the molecule as well as the charge distribution within it. Even a small modification to a molecular shape or size alters the drug effectiveness. As the example of Lipitor shows, molecular shape and size matter. In this chapter, our first goal is to understand the relationship between two-dimensional Lewis structures and three-dimensional molecular shapes. We will see the intimate relationship between the number of electrons involved in a molecule and the overall shape it adopts. Armed with this knowledge, we can examine more closely the nature of covalent bonds. The lines used to depict bonds in Lewis structures provide important clues about the orbitals that molecules use in bonding. By examining these orbitals, we can gain a great understanding of the behavior of molecules. Mastering the material in this chapter will help you in later discussions of physical and chemical properties of the substance. So the learning objectives for this chapter are the use of the valence shells electron pair repulsion to predict molecular geometry. Predict dipoles based on molecular geometry. By the end of this chapter, you will relate molecular polarity to properties such as boiling point. Also, you will be able to explain concepts comprising valence bond theory. You will describe hybrid orbitals and also explain the existence of cis and trans isomers based on the features of pi bonds. You will define molecular orbital theory and also explain the formation of bonding and antibonding orbitals. And you will describe the molecular orbital representation of simple diatomic species. So let's start to talk about the molecular shapes. The Lewis structure, as we mentioned before, show bonding and lone pairs, but do not denote shape. It doesn't give us any uh, idea about the shape of the molecules, but we will use the Lewis structure to help us to determine the shapes. Here we see some common shapes of molecules with two or three atoms connected to the center atom. We have here the atom of carbon in the middle, and here we have the two oxygen. We have a sulfur here and two oxygen, and even though we have two atoms bind to the uh, central atom, this shape is linear and this one is bent. We have here three bond, bond to the central atom, and we can see that's a trigonal planar, while this one that also has three is a trigonal pyramidal, and this one has another different shape that is a T-shaped. 
and we will learn during this discussion why even though we have like for example four atoms in each of this we have three different kinds of shape and here we have three atoms that combine together to create the CO2 or the SO2 why even though we have the same number of atoms we can have different shapes so what determines the shape of a molecule simply put electrons pairs whether they be bonding or non-bonding they will repel each other by assuming the electron pairs are placed as far as possible from each other we can predict the shape of the molecule so here we have for example the linear is that we have one atom here and one bond here with one another bond here so if we put this bond like in this place they're gonna be like 90 degrees far away and this is pretty close because they can put what 100 and 80 and the repulsion between these electrons and this electron will be minimized okay because it will be in the farthest place that they could be because if you get close this one to the side even though this is gonna be uh, pretty far but from this side will be closed okay so the perfect angle for for this type of arrangement is 180 degrees for the linear and the trigonal planner when we have some kind of arrangement like this the angle will be 120 for tetrahedral is going to be 109.5 and for trigonal bipyramidal will be you will have you will have on some of them a 90 degrees angle and in other 120 degrees and the octahedral you're going to have 90 degrees angle between all basically the uh, bonds in that type of structure okay so they are basically arranged to to avoid or to minimize the repulsion of those electrons from the bonds in this case this is the balanced shell electron pair repulsion model okay is a model that predict the structure or the shape of the molecule when we look for the, to avoid or to minimize that repulsion from the uh, electrons from the pair of electrons in bond or also they could be like lone pair electrons and we're gonna see that a little bit later so electron domains we can refer to the direction to which electrons point as electron domains this is true whether there is one or more electron pairs pointing in that direction the central atom in this molecule a has four electron domains it has one electron domain here that is a lone pair it has one here that is this single bond one here that is this single bond and two here that are this uh, double bond okay so we have one we have two three and four electron domains around the a uh, atom so the valence shells electron shell re electron pair repulsion that v is epr model is the best arrangement of a given number of electron domains is the one that minimizes the repulsion among among them. If we use, for example, balloon, you can try this at home. If you can, for example, tie two balloons, they're gonna basically uh, uh, do a, a, an automatic rearrange rearrange of a linear. If you add a third balloon, you're gonna have a, a trigonal planner. If you add a fourth, you're gonna have a rearrange like this that is called the tetrahedral orientation. So you can try this at home. It's just with balloons just tie two balloons and you will see that they will be 100 degrees the, 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 the where they were arranged automatically it will be 180 degrees between them if you add a, a third one it's gonna be gonna take this shape that is the uh, trigonal planner and you're gonna have 120 degrees of angle between these two balloons and also between this two and also between these two and if you add a fourth you're gonna have, have a tetrahedral orientation and this one is going to have a 109.5 degree so the electron domains geometry the table here shows the electron domain geometries for two through six electron domains around a central atom to determine the electron domain geometry count the total number of lone pairs single double and triple bonds and on the central atom Remember that the double the double bond is going to count as one, not as two. So if you have a double bond, it counts as one electron domain. If you have a triple bond, that triple bond will count as one electron domain, not as three. Okay, so one lone pair, each lone pair is going to be one electron domain. A single bond, one electron domain. Double bond, one electron domain. Triple bond, one electron domain. 
So here we have two electron domain. When you have two electron domain of the central atom, the uh, electron ge geometry is going to be linear. So it's going to have at 180 degrees of the angles between the bonds. If the central atom has one, two, three electron domain, the electron domain geometry will be trigonal planar. It's electron domain because we are looking to the arrangement of the electrons. We are counting. We are just looking at the electrons. They could be, remember, as a lone pair, as a single bond, as a double bond, or as a triple bond. Okay, so the important thing is the uh, geometry. We're looking for that geometry of those electrons. And the angle is going to be 120 degrees. For, if we have fourth electron domain around the central atom, the electron domain geometry is going to be tetrahedral. And the angle between those electron domains are going to be, is going to be 109.5 degrees. Now, if we have five electron domains around the central atom, the electron domain geometry is going to be trigonal bipyramidal. And we're going to have two different types of angles. We're going to have a 90 degree angles, and we're going to have a 120 degree angle between this one here, 90 degrees, and between the one and the plane are going to be 120 degrees. If we have six electron domains around the central atom, the electron domain geometry is going to be octahedral. And every bond is going to be 90 degrees from the other bond. Okay, So the angle of every bond to bond is going to be a 90 degrees angle. So that was the electron geometry. Now let's talk about the molecular geometry. In NH3, when we draw the Lewis structure, we're going to have the nitrogen in the middle. Remember that we're going to have in the middle the ones that can make the most number of bonds. And nitrogen is from family 5, and it has a lone pair in the top, and it could have 1, 2, 3 individual electrons to make 3 bonds. So each hydrogen is going to add one electron, so one electron from hydrogen, and the electron from here of nitrogen is going to create the bond, because remember that in each single bond, you're going to have two electrons. So we have here two, four, six, and eight electrons. We have the octet for this nitrogen, and this is basically the uh, Lewis structure. But then we're going to drive, draw sorry, the uh, electron domain. Okay, So we have one, two, three, four so that means that the electron uh, geometry for this central atom is tetrahedral. Okay, so they're going to be around 109 degrees between them. But the molecular geometry is going to be the tri trigonal bi pi pyramidal. Okay, so that's going to be the molecular geometry for NH3. Even though the electronic is tetrahedral, but the molecular could be a different one, as is this, in this case. We have the trigonal pyramidal. Once you have determined the electron domain geometry, you use the arrangement of the bonded atoms to determine the molecular geometry. So for example, this one is not an atom. So you're going to see the bonds that has the atom to determine the molecular geometry. So you can see here that this looks like a trigonal pyramidal. So that's why the name of the molecular geometry. In tables 9.2 and 9.3, it shows the potential molecule geometry. We'll look at to each electron domain to see what molecular geometries are possible. So let's start with the linear. This is the easiest. We have an atom in the middle, and this atom has two electron domains, and these are going to be linear, as we mentioned before. An example of this could be the carbon dioxide. Carbon in the middle, we have one electron domain here, another electron domain here. We have two electron domains. But how many electrons we have around carbon? We have eight. Remember that in each bond, each bond, we're going to have two electrons. We have one bond here, another here, so two double two bonds. So we're going to have four electrons and four electrons here. Around carbon, we have eight electrons. So in the linear domain, there is only one molecular geometry, the linear. So in this case, we're going to have the electron domain and the molecular do geometry are going to be the same. The, the, I mean, the, electro the, the electron geometry and the molecular geometry, they're, they're going to be the same. So the electron domain geometry, linear. The molecular geometry, linear. If there are only two atoms in the molecule, the molecule will be linear no matter what the electron domain is. If you just have two atoms. So for example, hydrogen, H2. 
Now the trigonal planar electron domain. In this one, we have a central atom that has three electron domains around. These three electron domains could be three bonds. If you have three bonds, that means that you're going to have a trigonal planar molecular geometry as well as the electron domain geometry. Okay, because the electron domain geometry, you have three, uh, just three electron, um, three do electron domains around that um, central atom. So the electron domain is going to be always trigonal planar geometry when you have three electron domains. Now, but remember that also instead of three bonds, you could have two bonds and one lone pair, as is this example. So that's why even though you have an electron domain geometry of a trigonal planar, but a molecule could be, a molecular geometry could be a bent, as is the case of NO2. The NO2 is an electron, do electron domain geometry of trigonal planar because we have one, two, and three electron domains, but the molecular is going to be bent, the molecular geometry. Okay, so when we have three electron domain, we have the electron uh, domain geometry will be trigonal planar, but the molecular could be trigonal planar if all the three electron domains are bond, but if just you have just two bonds, you're going to have one electron domain, one electron domain that is going to be a lone pair. This will be then a bent with the electron domain geometry trigonal planar, but the molecular geometry is going to be bent. There are two molecular geometries, trigonal planar if all electron domains are bonding, and the bent if one of the domains is a non-bonding pair. Let's see the tetrahedral electron domain. The tetrahedral is when the, when the central atoms has four electron domains around, and the geometry, electronic geometry, is going to be tetrahedral. And here we're going to have three possible molecular geometry. If all of these electron domains are bond, then the molecular geometry will be tetrahedral. If three of these are bond and one is a lone pair, the electron domain is still tetrahedral geometry, but the molecular geometry will be trigonal planar. And if you have two lone pairs and two bonds, that means that that molecule that, that has an electron domain geometry of tetrahedral, the molecular is going to be bent. And here are some examples. We have, here is methane. Methane has an electronic domain geometry tetrahedral and the molecular geometry also tetrahedral. The NH3 has the electron domain geometry of tetrahedral, but the molecular geometry of trigonal planar and the molecule of water that has an electron domain of tetrahedral, one, two, three, four electron domains around the central atom. When we have four electron domains, the electron domain geometry is going to be tetrahedral. But the molecular, if when we when we going to talk about the, the, the to determine the molecular, we're going to look for the bonds that we have in the molecule, and we can see that these bond bonds are bent. So that's why when you have two bonds and two lone pairs you're going to have a bent molecular geometry when you have an electron domain, the geometry of tetrahedral. There are three molecular geometries, the tetrahedral, if or are bonding pairs, trigonal pyramidal, if one is a non-bonding pair, and bent, if there are two non-bonding pairs. Non-bonding pairs and bond angle. Non-bonding pairs are physically larger than bonding pairs. Therefore, the repulsions are greater. greater. This tends to compress bond angles. So that means that when we have this here, we do have two nuclei, and this is the area where the electrons are. And most of the time, if this is a single a bond, we have how many electrons here? Two. Okay, so this is basically the area of where you can find those two electrons. Now, when you have a non-bonding pair, this is the area, a larger area, that you're going to find where you could find those electrons. So that means that because of that, you're going to have a large area. You're going to have a large also repulsion. That's why you're going to push a little bit down this, uh, this bonds as, as compared with this one. And the angle between them is going to go get uh, smaller, okay? Because you're pushing due to that presence of that uh, cloud of electrons. You are getting those bonds closer together. And instead of 109.5, it's going to be 107. 
Remember that here we have how many electron domains in nitrogen? One, two, three, four. So that means that the electron domain geometry is going to be tetrahedral. And they expected that the angles between those bonds are going to be 109.5. But because we have these two lone pairs alone here, the repulsion is going to be greater and they're going to push more those hydrogen nitrogen bonds to get closer and the angle will be, will be reduced from 109.5 to 107 as well as in water. In water we have two different uh, non-pair bonding, non-pair non electrons, okay? So we have one pair here, another one here, so it's, you're going to add that area and it's going to basically push har uh, harder, okay, those uh, bonds so they get closer and as I can see, you can see here the angle between them instead of be 109.5 because the electron domain is a tetrahedral the angle is going to be 104.5 degrees okay due to the repulsion of in this case two long pairs okay two non-bonding pairs Let's talk now about multiple bonds and bond angle. Double and triple bonds have larger electron domains than single bonds. They exert a greater repulsive force than single bonds, making their bond angles greater. So here we have again, uh, this one has a carbon in the middle. We have one, two, three electron domains. So that means that the electron geometry for this one is going to be trigonal planar. And we have one, two, three bonds. So that means that the molecular geometry is going to be also trigonal planar. And for the trigonal planar, the angle is going to be 120 degrees. But experimentally, when you took this molecule and measured those angles, here you're going to have a 124.3 degrees instead of 120, making this getting closer. Instead of 120, we have 111.4. And this is because the repulsion is this two two uh of this uh, double bond, okay, the um, cloud here of electron is, is going to induce to repulse these two electrons and make them get closer in this in this angle, okay, so that's why the angle is going to be lower, smaller than 120, it's going to be 111.4, and for this one it's going to be 124.3. Expanding beyond the octet rule, remember that some elements can break the octet rule and make more than four bonds or have more than four electron domains. The result is two more possible electron domains. If we have five electron domains, it's going to be trigonal bipyramidal. If we're going to have six electron domains, it's going to call octahedral, as was seen in the slide on electron domain geometry, so before. So the trigonal uh, bipyramidal electron domain there are two distinct positions in this geometry. We have the axial and the equatorial. Lone pairs occupy equatorial position always. So if you need to put a lone pair in this type of arrangement, you're going to put them in the equatorial position. And the equatorial position are the ones that are here in the plane. This is the pyramidal here, and it's a trigonal. We have three sides, and it's bipyramidal because we have one in the top, and we're going to have one in the bottom. That's why it's called the trigonal bipyramidal. And if you need to put some electrons, remember that you're going to put those electrons in the equatorial position, not in the axial position. So, there are four distinct molecular geometries in this domain. We have first the trigonal bipyramidal. That means that we have here the central atom with five electron domains. If all those five are bond, the geometry, molecular geometry is going to be also trigonal bipyramidal. If we have four electron domains and one lone pair, remember that the lone pair is going to be in the equatorial position and that will create a molecular geometry of seesaw. If we have three bonding domains and two non-bonding, that means that we're going to have two here, okay, two uh, lone pairs in this area. So we're going to have a T-shape. Here we can see the T-shape. And if we have two bonding domains, it's going to be this one and this one, you're going to have three uh, lone pairs of electrons. They're all going to be in the planner. 
So that means that we're going to have a linear molecular shape. So even though the electron domain geometry is a trigonal bipyramidal, you could have the molecular geometry, a, a, linear, a linear geometry. Okay, the same thing with the T-shape, CISO, and trigonal bipyramidal. For all of this example of molecular geometry, the electron domain geometry is the same, trigonal bipyramidal. If we have five bonds, it's going to be trigonal bipyramidal, the molecular geometry. If we have four bonds and one lone pair, it's going to be the CISO molecular geometry. If we have three bonds and two lone pairs, we're going to have the T-shaped molecular geometry. If we have two bonds and three lone pairs, then we're going to have the linear. Remember always that the ele electrons, a lone pair electrons, are going to be in the equatorial position. And the last one is the octahedral electron domain. Here we have basically six electron domains. And when we have the six electron domain, the central atom, the electron domain geometry is going to be octahedral. And we're going to have three molecular geometries. In this case, we're going to have, if we have six bonds, it's going to call octahedral. If we have five bonds and one lone pair, this lone pair, we don't have here an axial or equatorial position. All of them are the same. So we can remove the one in the bottom or in the top or the one in the in this uh, plane position. And it's going to be the same because all of this are has the same shape. So here we have five bonds and one lone pair. And this will be a square pyramidal. And then if we remove, and, and if we have another molecule with six electron domain, four of them bonds and two uh, non-bond or two lone pairs, we're going to have a square planar. planar. Okay, so square planner has a molecular geometry, but the electron domain geometry is going to be octahedral. The square pyramidal is going to be a molecular geometry with an electron domain geometry of octahedral, and the molecular geometry octahedral we have also the electron domain octahedral. <clears throat> we all have also uh, larger molecules. And for larger molecules, look at the geometry about each atom rather than the molecule as a whole. So here, for example, this part is going to be tetrahedral. This one is going to be trigonal planar. We have one, two, three electron domains here, and all of them are with bonds. So it's going to call E uh, trigonal planar. And here, we're going to have basically A electron domain is tetrahedral. Okay, in this one, but the molecular is going to be a bent. So we have a bent geometry in this place. We're going to have a trigonal planner in this place, and we're going to have a tetrahedral in this area. Okay, looking for the central atom geometry of each atom in the molecules. Now let's talk about the polarity of molecules. The molecule could be covalent or ionic. If it's covalent, the bonds could be polars or nonpolars. So if it's no, the molecule is no polar. If you didn't have polar bonds, that means that the molecule is nonpolar. If you have polar bonds, then you need to uh, evaluate the polarity of the molecule. Because even though you have polar bonds, the molecule could be polar or nonpolar. So it's not a guarantee that you have, if you have a polar bond, the molecule is going to be polar, okay? Remember, we need to look for the polarity of the bonds and then evaluate that polarity in the molecule. So if we have, for example, that they cancel, the positive and the negative, they cancel, the molecule is nonpolar. If no, then the molecule is going to be polar. We're going to see this example in a few minutes. So here, we, first, we need to determine if the molecule is covalent or is ionic. If it's covalent, then we need to look for the bonds. The bonds could be polar or nonpolar. If they are nonpolar, all the bonds in the molecule are nonpolar, then the molecule is nonpolar. But if you have polar bonds in the molecule, you need to evaluate by using the shape of the molecule to determine if those Polar bonds could make the molecule polar because not necessary if you have a polar bond, the molecule is going to be polar. That's important, okay? Maybe yes or maybe not. It's going to depend 
on the geometry of the molecular shape of the molecule. So, for example, here we have CO2, carbon dioxide, and this bond here is polar. And we start here with the positive, partial positive at this point, and here partial negative. As well, this bond here also is polar. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so the oxygen is going to pull more. Those electrons here that are how many? Four. These four electrons are going to be pulled a little bit more than for, uh, by oxygen than for carbon, making this end partial negative, as well as this one. But what happens is that both of them are pulling in different way, and that will cancel. So that's why even though you have two polar bonds, the molecule is nonpolar. Here we have water, oxygen here, hydrogen here. The oxygen it has a higher electronegativity than the hydrogen. So that oxygen will pull those electrons. How many we have here? Two electrons. These two electrons closer to oxygen as well as this one. So in this case, both of them are going through the same point. And because of that, they are not canceled between them. So they have polar bonds that create a polar molecule. So water is a polar molecule. Now let's talk about the balance bond theory. Here we have 1s. We have hydrogen. We have one electron in the 1s orbital. So when they combine together, they can create the H2, okay? That is the overlap between these two orbitals. Also, when we have, for example, HCl, one of the electrons of the chlorine is in the orbital 3p, while the one of the uh, electrons in hydrogen is in 1s. So these two orbitals are doing an overlap between a 1s and a 3p. And when we creating the chlorine-chlorine uh, bond, that means that we are doing interaction between an orbital, a 3p orbital for one chlorine, with the 3p orbital with the other chlorine. In valence bond theory, electrons of atoms, of two atoms, begin to occupy the same space. This is called overlap of orbitals. The sharing of space between two electrons of opposite spin result in a covalent bond. So because of that, this is the bond where they are sharing those electrons. This area here is the bond where they're sharing those electrons. This area here is the bond where they overlap those orbitals and is the area where you could find those electrons. Okay, so basically where, where they overlap, at that, at that is the place where you can find those two electrons. Also, as you get these two orbitals close together so they can overlap and share those electrons, it is important to understand that also the nuclei are getting closer. There is always an optimum distance between the two nuclei and in any covalent, covalent bond. So, increased overlap brings the electrons and nuclei closer together until the balance is reached. Between the like charge repulsion and the electron nucleus attraction, atoms can't get too close because the intermolecular repulsions get too great. So here we have the potential energy of a system consisting of two hydro hydrogen atoms, changed as the atoms come together to form an hydrogen molecule. Okay, so here we have the potential energy, and here we have the distance between those two atoms of hydrogen. When the atoms are infinitely far apart, they do not feel each other, and so the energy approach to zero. As the distance between the atoms decrease, they're getting closer they together, the overlap between their 1s orbital increase because of the resultant increase in the electron density between the nuclei the potential energy of the system start to decrease so when they are getting close the potential energy of the system start to decrease that is the strength of the bond increases as shown by the decrease in the potential energy of the two atom system however also this figure shows that the energy increase sharply at this point, okay, when the distance between the two uh, hydrogen nuclei is less than 0.74 Armstrong.
the increase in potential energy of the system at this point, which becomes significant at short internuclear distances, is due mainly to the electrostatic repulsion between the nuclei. So as they're getting close here, they're going to start to feel that repulsion due to the nuclei. The internuclear distance at the minimum of the potential energy curve, curve that is basically this point here, correspond to the bond length of the molecule. So basically this is the bond length, length of the molecule that is 0.74 Armstrong. The potential energy at this minimum correspond to the bond strength. Thus, the observed bond length is the distance at which the attractive forces between unlike charges, electron and nuclei, nuclei, are balanced by the repulsive force between like charge. Now let's talk about the hybrid orbitals. Hybrid orbitals form by mixing of atomic orbitals to create new orbitals of equal energy. This type of orbitals are called the generate orbitals because they have the same energy. And this process of mixing atomic orbitals to produce um, hybrid orbitals is called as hybridization. When two orbitals mix, they create two orbitals. When three atomic orbitals mix, they create three molecular orbitals. So if you mix, mix two atomic orbitals, you will create two molecular orbitals. So let's see beryllium. Beryllium has an sp hybridization. When we look at the orbitals diagram for beryllium, we see that there are only pair electrons in full sublevel sublevels. So we have two electrons in the 1s and two electrons in the 2s. But the thing is the beryllium can create two bonds. How does beryllium can do that? Beryllium makes electron deficient compounds with two bonds for beryllium. Why? Because it's induced a sp hybridization. So in that case, one electron is going to move to a p orbital, and then we're going to mix 1s with 1p. So we're going to mix two orbitals, atomic orbital, to create two molecular orbitals. So when we mix the 2s with the 2p, we have two, we're going to create two sp. This is an sp orbital, and this is an sp orbital. This is a mix between an S and a P, and this orbital also is a mix between the S and the P. These are pure S, these are pure P's. So in this case, we're mixing one S with one of the P of the three that we have available. Okay, And that's why we are mixing two atomic orbitals to create two molecular orbitals with a hybridization of SP because we create this by the combination of one S and 1p. The sp orbitals are, at, um, we produce this by mixing the s and the p orbitals and this will produce two degenerated orbitals that are hybrids of the two orbitals. Here we have the s and here we have the p and because of that when we combine these two we create two hybrid orbitals that are called the sp orbital. When they are individual, we are, have an S. If we have that hybridization, we have an S and we have a, a P. But when we combine them, we're going to create the SP. This SP orbitals have two lobes, like a P orbital. But one of them is going to be larger than the other. Okay, And when we uh, basically when we superimpose these two um, orbitals, hybrid orbitals, we're going to create something like this. This one is an SP and this one is an SP. Okay. So here, once again, we have a hybridization between 1s and 1p to create two sp hybrid orbitals. So these two degenerated orbitals would align themselves 180 degrees from each other. As we can see here in beryllium, we're going to have 1sp here and 1sp here. This is consistent with the observed geometry of uh, beryllium compounds. Remember, we have a um, central atom with two electron domain. So when we have two electron domain, the electron domain geometry is going to be linear. Okay, so we have here that linear uh, geometry that we expected, and is we have here two orbitals, sp, with a 180 degree angle between them. 
and this is the overlap between the beryllium and the p orbital from fluor fluorine and this is where you can find this two electron as well as this side so when we have BEF2, we have beryllium in the middle and the fluorine in both sides. The sp orbitals from beryllium and the uh, p orbital from the fluorine. Also, we have another hybridization that is called the sp2. In this case, we are combined 1s with 2p. So that means that we're going to have three um, degenerated orbitals and as sp2 because it is going to be produced by the combination of 1s and 2p. So each of this is known as, as an sp2 orbitals. And we have three of them. We have three sp2 orbitals. And basically here we have, they can create this type of trigonal planar um, configuration or, or geometry. Sorry. Okay. So when we have the sp2, the sp2 will produce a trigonal planar geometry. And the sp3 will be 1s with three p's, and we combine four orbitals to produce four hybrid orbitals that are known as sp3 because each of them is a product of the combination of 1s and 3p orbitals. And we're going to have here 1, 2, 3, 4, sp3, and the uh, geometry for this is going to be tetrahedral. Okay, so when we have a tetrahedral, the angles are going to be 109.5, and the orbitals, hybrid orbitals associated with the tetrahedral is going to be sp3. The um, hybridization of orbitals for a linear is going to be sp, and for the trigonal planar is going to be sp2. So hypervalent molecules, the elements which have more than an octet, uh, where valence bond model would use the d orbitals to make more than four bonds. This view works for period three and below. Theoretical studies suggest that the energy needed would be too great for this. So a more detailed bonding view is needed when then when will we use in this curse? So what happened with water? Water has an electronic uh, rear range of tetrahedral. So we can see here the tetrahedral as an electronic domain geometry, but the angle of the molecular geometry is going to be a bend. Okay, and we're going to have here two orbital sp3 with two long pair electrons. We start the discussion with water and the angle question, why is 104.5 instead of 90 degrees? Oxygen has two bonds and two long pairs for electron domains. The result is the sp3 hybridization. Okay, when we have the electron domain of four, that is going to be a tetrahedral. And as mentioned before, when you have a tetrahedral arrangement, the orbitals hybridization is going to be sp3. That's why you're going to have a a angle close to 109.5. And remember that this angle is smaller because of the cloud of electrons of these two lone pairs that will push those uh, bonds closer together. So we have here that in linear, as I mentioned, linear we're going to have the orbitals hybridization is going to be sp2, sp, for the trigonal planar is going to be sp2, and for the tetrahedral is going to be sp3, because we combine 1s with 3p, here we combine 1s with 2p's, and here we combine the s with a p. So we're going to draw this loose structure, and then we're going to use the valence shell electron pair repulsion to determine the electron domain geometry, and then we'll specify the hybrid orbitals needed to accommodate these um, electron pairs. So once again, if we have a linear, we're going to have the sp hybrid orbitals always. If we have uh, three electron domain, we're going to have the sp2 hybrid orbitals, and we have four, that is tetrahedral, the orbitals has going to be a hybridization of sp3. So how this can be related to the types of bonds, how those a double or triple bond form. 
It can't if we only use hybridized orbitals. However, if we use the orbitals which are not hybridized, we can have a sideway overlaps. Two types of bond, the sigma bond and the pi bond. So in all the multiple bonds, we're going to have always one, at least one of them is going to be sigma. All the others are going to be pi. So here we have a sigma bond is this type of bond. And the pi bond is going to be this type of bond. Here we have the p orbitals, but the overlap is head to head. And when we have that type of overlap, head to head, is called a sigma bond. So the sigma bonds are characterized by the head to head overlap and the cylindrical symmetry of electron density in the internuclear axis. So the electrons are going to be in that internuclear axis axis around that internuclear axis. Now the pi bond, we're going to have also the p orbitals, but the interaction is side by side. Okay, so the pi bonds are characterized by side by side overlap and that the electron density is going to be above and below the internuclear axis. So in the sigma, you're going to have that those electron density is going to be in the nuclear x axis while in the pi bond is going to be above and below that internuclear axis so uh, here we have some example of bonding in molecules we have a carbon carbon here this is going to be a double bond so we're going to have an overlap head to head this is sigma and we're going to have a side to side overlap this is the p so we're going to have one bond here, that is the uh, pi bond, and one bond here, that is the sigma, okay? So sigma bonds are always, I mean, single bonds are always sigma bonds. Multiple bonds have one sigma bonds. All the other bonds are going to be pi bonds, as I mentioned before, okay? So here we have one type of sigma bond interaction between this sp2 and this S for hydrogen. So this is a head-to-head -head interaction. So this type of bond is going to be a sigma bond, as well as this one, as well as this one that goes in front of you. And this side-by-side -side is going to be the pi bond. So we see here the pi bond all around here, over and below that axis, and we're going to see the sigma. And we're going to have one and two bonds. This is a double bond. Okay, here we're going to have one sigma-sigma interaction. I mean, one sigma interaction between these two orbitals. This is going to be an sp. Okay, so once again, uh, let me uh, clarify this. We have here one, two, three. This is a trigonal planar. So that means that this type of orbital are sp2, and this is a p. So here we're going to have always, when we have an sp2 orbital, you're going to have always our pure p orbital. That pure p orbital is the one that is going to interact side by side with another p, pure p orbital of a central atom that has an sp2 configuration at least. Okay, so this carbon also has an sp2 configuration because it's a trigonal planner, and because of that, we have one, two, three sp2 and one p pure. Okay, one p pure. So that's one, both of them are going to interact side by side to create this pi bond. Now, when we have a triple bond, we're going to have the sp, because this is linear, this carbon has a linear arrangement with these two orbitals, so this is sp. So that means that we're going to have two sp, and we're going to have one p pure here, and one p pure at this side. Okay, so this ones that are going up and down, this one is going to interact side by side, and the one that are going to go to the front and the back as this one, these are going to interact side by side also. So this here in the middle, the interaction is head to head. So this is the sigma, while this interaction is going to be a pi bond, and this and this is going to be also a pi bond. Okay, so here we can see, oh, sorry, Ugh. here we can see the pi bond for this two p pures orbitals. And then the one in the plane, okay, this is one P pure, 
this is the other PPR and in the interaction side by side in front and in the back side. So we have here one P orbital, we have here another P orbital in the, in the plane, and in the middle here we have the sigma. So we have one sigma and two pi bonds. Always we're going to have at least one sigma. In the, in the double bond we're going to have one sigma and one pi bond, and the triple bond we're going to have one sigma and two pi bonds. And here, this interaction is going to be sigma s sp because the hybridization is, or for this orbital s is, is basically the, is not hybridization. The, the or this orbital is an s orbital, and the hybridization for this orbital is an sp. So this bond is known as sigma s sp. This one is known as sigma s sp two, as well as this one. This one is sigma. S, sp2. This one in the middle, where you can see that is the interaction head-to-head, -head, is known as sigma. This one is sp2, as sp2. So this one is known as sigma, sp2, sp2. This one is known as pi pp. Okay, so the, 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 the name for this type of bond is pi pp, because those are the two orbitals that overlap to create the pi orbital, or bond, sorry. Also, when we are talking about the double bond, we're going to have the cis and trans isomer. So here we have a, a formula of C2Cl2H2, and we can create this molecule that we have a double bond between these two carbon, and we have here a chlorine and a hydrogen in this side, and we have here a chlorine and a hydrogen in this side. When we have two hydrogens that they are opposed, okay, we have one in the, in the top and the other one in the bottom, they are opposed. This is known as the trans. And when we have both hydrogens in the same side, this is known as the cis. So this one in the left is known as the trans 1,2-dichloroethane, and this one is known as cis 1,2-dichloroethane, okay? Because we have those hydrogen in the same side, and here we have those hydrogens in opposite sides. So when you have opposite, opposite sides in different carbons, it's known as the trans. When they are in the same site in different carbons, they're called the cis 1, 2, uh, the chloroethane or the cis isomer. So this is the cis isomer, and this is a trans isomer. So let's talk a little bit more about, we, we touched a little bit of the localized or delocalized electrons in the, the chapter before. Uh, so here, the bonding electrons, sigma or pi, that are specifically shared between two atoms are called localized electrons because they are between those two atoms. In many molecules, we can't describe all the electrons that way because we have resonance. The other electrons shared by multiple atoms are called the localized electrons. So sometimes we're going to have two electrons that will always be between those same two atoms. And if they're always in that place between those two atoms, those are localized. But if we have electrons that can move inside the molecules between atoms, those electrons are called the localized. So here we have benzene. Benzene is the organic molecule that has six sigma bonds and a p orbital on each carbon atom which form the localized bonds using one electron from each p orbital. So here we have, between these two, you, get, you can have an interaction side to side, also between these two and these two to create basically something like this. But also you can create the interaction between these two, between these two, and between these two. In this case, we're going to have always a double, single, double, single, double, sing, single bond arrangement. Okay, so that's why we can see here a double bond single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. Double bond, single, double, single, double, and single. Okay, so we have here a uh, localized uh, electrons here, but when they basically do the resonance, that this means that they're going to move from here to here to create this type of interaction. Now, they will be known as the localized pi bond. Okay, so in this case, we get the resonance give that... Um, uh, give that characteristic of the localized pi bond. 
Now let's talk about the molecular orbital, MO theory. Wave properties are used to describe the energy of electrons in a molecule. Molecular orbitals have many characteristics like atomic orbitals. Number one, they have a maximum of, elect of two electrons per orbital. The electrons in the same orbitals have opposite spin. Also, each orbital has a definite ener energy and they can be visualized electron density by a contour diagram. Also, they differ from atomic orbitals because they represent the entire molecules. The atomic orbitals represent the single atom. So when we're talking about the uh, molecular orbitals, we're talking about a representation of the entire molecule. Whenever two atomic orbitals overlap, two molecular orbitals are formed one bonding and one anti-bonding. So we're going to create from each molecular orbital created is due to one atomic orbital. So when we combine two atomic orbitals, we're going to create two molecular orbital orbitals. One of them is going to be a bonding and the other one is going to be non-anti-bonding. The bonding orbitals are a constructive combination of atomic orbitals while the anti-bonding orbitals are destructive combinations of atomic orbitals. They have a new feature unseen before, that is the nodal plane, that occurs where electron density equals zero. Whenever there is a direct overlap of orbitals forming a, a bonding and an anti-bonding orbitals, they are called sigma molecular orbitals. The antibonding orbital is distinguished with an asterisk as sigma asterisk. Here is an example for the formation of hydrogen molecule from two atoms. We have here two atomic orbital and we're going to create one and two molecular orbitals. This one is known as the um, bonding or, or molecular orbital and this as the antibonding molecular orbital. And here we have a node between these two nuclei, okay? So here we have the sigma 1s and the sigma asterisk 1s. Sigma bonding, sigma anti-bonding. So we have here the hydrogen. We have 1s here, 1s here, atomic orbitals. When we combine them, we're going to create two atomic, two molecular orbital, one bonding and one anti-bonding. And as we can see here, this will predict that the molecule will, will exist because those two electrons are in the bonding molecular orbital. So an energy level diagram or molecular diagram shows how orbitals from atoms combine to give the molecule. In hydrogen, the two electrons go into the bonding molecular orbital, the lower in energy. The bond order is equal to one half of the number of bonding electron minus the number of anti-bonding electrons. So that means that we have two bonding electrons from here, zero anti-bonding electrons, so two minus zero is two, two divided by two is equal to one. So that bond under means that we have one bond between these two atoms. So we have a single bond between this hydrogen. So that's why hydrogen H2 is gonna have, is ha has or have a single bond between the two atoms of hydrogen. Can helium-2 form? Let's use the molecular orbital diagram to determine and if it has any bond order. So here we have the helium and the helium 1s, 1s. So we're going to combine those two to create the two orbit, molecular orbital diagram. One is the sigma 1s and the sigma anti, uh, asterisk 1s. So the bonding and the anti-bonding. And in this case, helium, each of them have two electrons. So we're going to have two and two is four. So we need to distribute four electrons in the molecular orbital. So we're going to put two here and two in the anti-bonding orbital. The bond order will be equal to the, sum, the, the subtraction between the um, electrons from the bonding and the anti-bonding. So we need two minus two is zero. And zero divided by two is zero. So between these two um, atoms, there is no bond. So therefore, helium as a diatomic molecule does not exist. Okay, because 
these electrons in the anti um, bond are anti bonding, and this eventually will not allow those uh, bonds to be created between the helium atoms. So that's why helium does not exist as a diatomic molecule. It exists just as helium monatomic. <clears throat> so here we have, in this case, when we are using also the p orbitals, okay, before when we have, we're com doing the combination of the s orbital, we're going to create the sigma. When we're using the uh, p orbitals, we have three and three, we have a total of six atomic orbital, we're going to create six molecular orbitals. We're going to create one sigma 2p, two pi 2p um, orbital. These are bonding, and these are anti-bonding, the same but anti-bonding. Pi 2p with the asterisk, and sigma 2p also with, with that asterisk. There are pi and pi asterisk orbitals from the p atomic orbitals. Since direct overlap is stronger, the effect of rising and lowering energy is greater for the sigma and the sigma asterisk. Okay, so in this case, we're going to have the sigma here, the pi bonding, pi antibonding, and sigma antibonding. There is one characteristic that can be uh, predicted by looking at the molecular orbital diagrams. That is the magnetism. The diamagnetism is the result of all electrons in every orbital being spin paired. These substances are weakly repelled by a magnetic field, while the paramagnetism is the result of the presence of one or more unpaired electrons in an orbital, and this will be attracted by a magnetic field. So here we have an example of uh, molecular orbital diagrams for different diatomic uh, molecules. So boron here we have the molecular orbital diagram and we can see here that we have two lone uh, electrons. So this one basically is paramagnetic. These one are paired. So we, we have that the C2 molecule is diamagnetic that, and nitrogen molecule is paramagnetic also. The, um, I'm sorry, diamagnetic. The oxygen is paramagnetic and the fluoride and the neon, both of them are diamagnetic. Okay, so in this case, we have the paramagnetic for oxygen as well as boron because they have uh, basically unpaired electrons available in their molecular orbital diagram. So the paramagnetism of oxygen, as we mentioned before, oxygen is paramagnetic. The Lewis structure would not predict the O2 as paramagnetic, but the molecular uh, diagram clear, clearly show that O2 is paramagnetic. Also, both show a double bond, uh, bond order of two for oxygen. So that means that be, uh, between those two atoms of oxygen, we have a double bond. So what about the heteronuclear diatomic molecules? We have seen now molecular orbitals diagram for um, basically almonuclear, just um, oxygen, o, o, oxygen and oxygen, and fluorine, fluorine, neon, neon, etc. But what about the heteronuclear? The atomic molecules can consist of atoms from different elements also. How does a molecular or, uh, orbital diagram reflect differences? The atomic orbitals have different energy, so the interactions change slightly. The more electronegative atom has orbitals lower in energy, so the bonding orbitals will more resemble them in energy. So that means that we, for example here, we have um, the molecular uh, orbital for nitric oxide, nitrogen and oxygen, and the oxygen is more electronegative than the, the nitrogen. So that's why they're going to have uh, the atomic orbitals with a little bit lower energy as compared with the one of nitrogen. So the 2s for nitrogen is going to have a higher energy than the 2s of oxygen, as well as the 2p of oxygen is going to have a lower energy than the 2p of nitrogen because oxygen has a higher electronegativity than nitrogen. And with this, we'll finish our chapter number nine, molecular geometry and bonding theories.